Muito bom dia. Muito obrigado pela presença de todos. É um prazer enorme para mim e para o Projó uh, o início desse seminário, que é a realização de um velho projeto do nosso mestre Alberto Dines, que finalmente começa a tomar forma agora, graças ao auxílio da Fundação Ford, da Odebrecht e principalmente do Google, que nos hospeda aqui, a quem nós agradecemos muitíssimo pela hospitalidade. Nós temos um programa muito intenso e muito é, rígido em termos de horário, porque são muitas pessoas que têm muito o que dizer, muito a debater, então nós vamos tentar ser o mais estrito possível em termos de horário. E para dar início a esse nosso trabalho, eu gostaria de chamar aqui o Scott Schaeffer, que é o vice-presidente do grupo de parcerias online do Google, tem PhD em engenharia mecânica e aeroespacial pela Universidade de Princeton e graduação e mestrado em engenharia aeroespacial pela Penn State University. E agradecemos muito a presença do Scott, que está aqui. Thank you so much, Scott. Well, thank you, Carlos, uh, and welcome, everyone. Bom dia. Uh, thank you for coming today. Uh, my name is Scott Sheffer, and I'm the vice president for the online partnerships group at Google. I'll give you all a second to put your, your phones in. I know some people are miking up here. Um, so uh, I'm responsible for managing Google's publisher network uh, around the world. We have a global team of about 300 people uh, that work with more than 2 million partners around the world. Uh, and we're responsible for working with partners ranging from large brand name uh, publishers all the way down to long tail bloggers, uh, like my son's blog, for example. I've been working with publishers for more than, uh, for more than seven years at Google, uh, and it's been an amazing ride over the last uh, you know, half decade and more. Uh, and so much has really changed in that last seven years. Uh, technology has advanced. Uh, there's just a completely different uh, environment out there. And I think part of what we're going to be talking about today and tomorrow is how to operate in that totally changed world. Uh, first, I'd like to thank Carlos, uh, Alberto Dinez, and the whole Projour organization for leading this project and making it happen. Uh, and I'm very excited to see how this project comes to fruition uh, and the output of this project. Um, and I don't think this would have been possible at all if Projour hadn't put their full effort into it. Uh, it's a visionary, inspiring, and innovative uh, initiative, and it's showing Brazilian leadership, uh, which is just absolutely great to see. Um, I'm also very excited to be here today. I'd love to talk about the, this business and what Google can do to help. Um, and it's, uh, it's my great pleasure to meet all of you who are supporting community outlets in Brazil. Um, you know, clearly, community outlets and, and journalism are important, not just here and to the web, but to the world at large. Uh, and when Projour reached out to us, we were very excited to be involved with this. It's going to be a tremendous project with, with huge opportunity and huge potential. So what I thought I would do this morning um, is provide some observations uh, and some thought starters for the next two days. Think of me as the intellectual appetizer uh, for the main course, which is going to happen over the next two days. Uh, it'll be light fair, some questions and, and ideas to put in your head uh, to think about. So with that, uh, let's go to the first slide. So if there's, if there's anything, uh, if there's only one thing that you walk away with uh, over the next two days is uh, to remember this, that small is big. Um, we're here today to discuss the importance of local media and journalism to democracy. Uh, and share best practices on how to grow sustainably. Um, Warren Buffett, who is a, a well-known American investor, uh, explains why he likes to invest in small local newspapers with two words, they're essential. Democracy really starts on the street corner, in the elementary school, in the high school, with the university press. Um, and the participation of the individual in political life is only really possible um, in the realm that's closest to their life, the local, the local press. Um, and you know, the large-scale press in the United States is really uh, the fruit of and a mirror of the local press. 
um, the reach of American democracy was constructed based on uh, the reach of the country's community journalism. And as many as you know, uh, the founding fathers of the United States thought so much uh, about the press that they enshrined the freedom of the press in the First Amendment to the United States Constitution. So it's a huge statement on the United States, and it's obviously a statement of how important journalism uh, and freedom of uh, free, free press is important to the world. Um, many of journalism's big names in Los Angeles, New York, Chicago, Boston, uh, Washington, were all shaped by the small press, the community press. And later today, you're going to hear from uh, Emma Meese from the Center for Community Journalism of Cardiff University, as well as Hans Decker from the Community Foundation of New Jersey, and Alberto Dinez from Peugeot, as they dis discuss further the fundamental impact of community outlets. So hopefully, at the end of the seminar, you'll walk away with a message that small is big. So it's because of this idea that we joined this project. Um, you know, the, the publisher ecosystem has always been part of our DNA at Google. Um, at, at Google, we believe publishers are essential to both a healthy web and a healthy society. Uh, we believe that access to different points of view, uh, different points of view of information, entertainment, uh, is essential to the world and is, is basically a fundamental human right. Without publishers, there's clearly no content, there's no advertising, there's no entertainment, and there's simply no web at all. In the 15 years since Google was born, our mission really hasn't changed. It's to organize the world's information and make it universally accessible and useful. And it's great to see efforts like this in Brazil uh, because we think that users will benefit by having access to more relevant uh, and more useful information as a result of this. And as I just mentioned, um, publishers are really part of our DNA at Google. Um, AdSense, our monetization solution, uh, was one of our first products. It was launched in 2003, and we just celebrated the 10th anniversary of, of AdSense earlier this year, in June of this year. Um, and as a matter of fact, it's so important to us that uh, in 2012, we shared about $7 billion in advertising revenue with our publisher partners worldwide. So again, that's $7 billion going to 2 million publishers around the world. Now, obviously, some of them are larger and some of them are smaller, uh, but it's a huge indication of Google's dedication to the publishing, uh, the publishing market. In addition to which, our Latin America team has been in the market for the last seven years. Uh, and nowadays, we have more than 150 publishers in Brazil alone. Um, and at the end of the day, Alberto Manoni, who I think is in the back there, um, who's our lead from Latin America, will talk a bit about um, Google's monetization solutions and talk about the successful case example of CGN, which is a newspaper from Cascavel, Paraná. So Google's goal is really to make the web, the, the, the web work for you. Um, and this slide shows a little bit about how we think about doing that to help publishers. Um, and around the circle, we think about this in five different ways. The first and the yellow is uh, developing the right type of content. The blue is attracting the right audience. Uh, the red is uh, engaging them longer, engaging your users longer. Um, the gray, which is a little hard to see, I guess, is in more places, engaging your users in more places. And finally, once you've developed content, developed a user audience, uh, engage them then to help you um, drive more revenue uh, from those users, from that user base. And so we've invested in a massive amount of infrastructure to unlock growth for our publishing partners. Um, from monetization to traffic generation to web analytics to web tools to content distribution. So technologies such as Google Plus Hangouts, YouTube help publishers reach millions of new users and engage with their content. And technologies such as AdSense, Ad Exchange, AdMob, and DoubleClick for Publishers help our publishers monetize um, and manage their indirect and direct sales uh, through advertising across any platform whatsoever. In addition to which, we have Google Media Tools, which is a website intended to guide specifically journalists through all of our Google resources. And in the longer run, we really hope to do more and more for our publishing partners. Um, we believe that there's so much more that we can do to remove a lot of the daily um, dross uh, and, and just hassle that you have in order to publish your content on the web. Um, so at the end of the day, what we really hope is that we can help you create great content 
um, uh, and allow you to focus on creating great content and developing your user relationships and unique user experiences. Um, and we've got many great examples of publishers that have done this with Google Solutions in Brazil. Um, for example, Leonardo Marquez, uh, as a hobby, created Melhores Destinos. Um, and by using Google Analytics, he was able to identify trends with his website uh, and then implemented AdSense in order to take advantage of those trends. And after one year, he was able to quit his day job and soon thereafter hired four people to develop content for his site. So we have brought specialists here today like Newton Neto, Marcelo Plieger, and Wagner Silva de Souza to talk about why visual content matters. And it's really no news at all um, that digital is always on, uh, that the internet has enabled people and users to find information uh, in a faster and easier way than at any time before in the history of mankind. Um, moreover, most users uh, who are newspaper readers are increasingly migrating to the internet and accessing content through mobile devices. Uh, and this has just exploded over the last couple of years, as I'm sure many of you know. People now don't just have access to more content, uh, but they can access it wherever they are and whenever they are. And a great example of this is the London Olympic Games in 2012, just some statistics around this. Um, it was a, a total turning point for mobile usage. For the first time, the majority of visits to the official London uh, Olympics website, 60% came from mobile devices. So that's a huge, huge shift. Um, here we have someone in the audience taking a picture with their mobile device. Uh, and this is, uh, is a clear indication. It's a, if you look at pictures in the press today of major events, in the past people would be taking pictures with their camera. Today they're taking pictures with mobile phones or their tablets. It's just a huge shift um, in, in the web. In addition to which, if you look at uh, two major uh, news outlets, the BBC and NBC, they had huge Olympic mobile showings, just some statistics on that. Turns out that one third of BBC web visits came from mobile devices during the Olympic Games. And 45% of NBC video requests during the Olympics came from mobile devices. So obviously this is people on the go utilizing their mobile devices. It's people watching TV with their mobile devices. And it's just opened up a whole new world of opportunity for how to engage with users uh, whenever they are. It's really an amazing shift in the marketplace. Uh, and I think really the key here, and this is the message I, I tell all my partners, um, I was in Australia two weeks ago, I was in Ireland about four weeks ago, and my message to all of our partners is, this is really a world where you have to think of mobile first. Um, think of mobile first, um, because this is where all the growth is going to be. New users are coming online in many, many geographies, and it's going to be a mobile first world. Just imagine what the mobile traffic in Brazil is going to be like next year during the World Cup. It's going to be amazing. And I think there's no, there's no doubt that the, the publisher of the future is going to be a multi-screen publisher. Um, just some statistics around this to put this in your mind to think about over the next two days. Um, there's going to be more internet-connected mobile devices, whether it's laptops or smartphones, on the planet. Uh, this year than there are actually people in the world. Now, obviously, that means multiple devices in many developed markets, but it's a really interesting statistic. In addition to which, the Gartner Group has estimated that this year will definitely be the year in which mobile phones, shipments of mobile phones, will outpace laptops and desktop computers. So again, this is a massive shift in the world. Um, it's estimated that about 90% of contact, of, of, sorry, human interaction with content takes place over the web today. Um, and certainly, smartphones have become an extension uh, of our bodies. Um, how many people in the audience either sleep with or sleep next to their mobile phone? It's okay. You can, it's, it's, you can admit it. It's all right. My wife sleeps next to hers and wakes up in the middle of the night, checks her email. It just has to be connected all the time. But this is a, this is a really big shift in the world, right? Like, it's, it's estimated that um, smartphone users spend an average of 82 minutes a day on their phone. It's like an hour and 20 minutes. It's a huge amount of time, and it's, a, it's just a massive shift. And if you think about this, there's some additional statistics on this. Um, today, about 63% of smartphone users uh, stay informed by reading portals, newspapers, and blogs. And about 75% of Brazilian smartphone owners watch videos on their smartphone. 
So the point here, I think, um, and again, this is what I'm, I'm talking to publishers around the world, is that users expect to access content wherever, whenever, and however they want to. They're going to be connected all the time, um, whatever device they happen to be on, wherever they happen to be. And we've seen, even in Google, um, looking at publisher information and our own data, that users will move very quickly on from a site that is not optimized for mobile. And they may never come back. So it's really, really important to think about how you can connect with users, whatever device they happen to be on. In addition to which, users expect social components uh, with their information and their content today. So an interesting question for you all to think about over the next two days is, for each individual user, and this is really true, each user expects a different user experience, how do you deliver the right content, the right device, the right form factor, with the right social context, and the right user experience for each and every user? My expectation when I look at my smartphone is going to be very different than when I look at my tablet or my PC or if I have internet-enabled TV, right? And so even for a single user, people are going to expect very different experiences across all those different devices. So recently I read a piece in which Lionel Barber, who's the editor of the Financial Times, was saying that in the future, our print product will divide, derive from the web offering and not vice versa. This is a massive shift, massive shift in the world, not just for journalism, but for content generation in general. And you know, across media, publishing, and entertainment, changes in the air. The number of smartphones, the growth of online video, social engagement, and the sheer number of publishers competing for users' attention, uh, creating content and monetizing it, is really changing the way that consumers find and consume information. Um, and, you know, I, was, I was very happy to see that in March of this year, it was estimated that about 88% of internet users in Brazil visit news and information sites. Um, and in tomorrow's session from print to digital, Caio Tulio, Alessandra Levy, and Antonio Prada will give you some more insights on how to harness the power of the web. A really good example of this comes from the North American market. Um, if you look at Hearst, which is a very large publisher, many of you may be aware of it, um, and specifically the example of their magazine Esquire, they have some very interesting and very differentiated um, user experiences across different platforms. So for example, if you go to Esquire on their tablet implementation, um, it's a very interactive, very immersive experience. It's very tactile. There are things that you can do to rotate visual images 360 degrees. You can pinch and you can zoom. Um, and it's just a, a very engaging way, because that's what people expect from a tablet. Conversely, with Esquire's mobile app, what you have is a way to access content on the go, on the fly, in bite-sized chunks, whether you're on the train or waiting for a plane or what have you, you want to get that content very, very quickly. And it's a very different user experience than, than, the, um, than the tablet. If you go to their desktop site, uh, they have engaging online video. They have it backed by social cues with, with Google+. Um, they use video to preview what's going to be coming next on their print editions or what's going to be coming next on their desktop editions. And really, for a user, they deliver a different experience wherever they're coming from, whatever device they're actually on. So I think essentially um, my message to you all is that it's, it's really not enough to have a digital strategy um, in addition to print anymore. In the world in which we live, you have to have a strategy for the digital world. Um, print is, is uh, it's a great business, but it's going to slowly and slowly fade away. Uh, and the future is certainly in digital. Now, that's clearly a threat to people who have a lot of their business in print. But I would also flip it and say that it's a massive opportunity because the beauty of digital is that you can have an amazingly customized and individualized user experience. You can connect with your user in a way that you could never connect with a broadsheet. Um, and I think that's the, um, that's the opportunity that I would urge you all to embrace as the world moves inexorably to the digital age. So with that, I wanted to quickly go over the agenda for the, uh, for the next two days. Um, uh, so this morning, um, sorry, yes. 
So we've got uh, the first talk at 10 o'clock is uh, what's the role of local journalism and how to build a sustainable operation uh, with Emma, Alberto, and Hans. Uh, and then uh, later on this morning, we've got uh, how to be independent and survive, which is clearly a, a very relevant topic uh, with Eugenio, Francisco, Cecilia, and Wilson. Uh, and then we got lunch at one o'clock. Um, and then uh, later on this afternoon, we've got the, the, the small great press uh, project with Anna and Carlos. Um, we've got how to reach audience readers and monetize your content uh, after that. Then we've got a coffee break. Uh, then we've got um, BNDES talking about uh, credit lines for small and medium enterprises. And at the end of today, Alberto Manoni is going to talk about um, a case of one of our publishers who uh, monetized with AdSense. And then tomorrow morning, uh, there's going to be an opening coffee uh, and then talking about from print to digital. Uh, followed by a break, and then um, visual content matters, which I referred to earlier. And then finally, closing remarks at, uh, at 1 o'clock, uh, delivered by Mauricio Morrow. So with that, um, I'd like to say obrigado, thank you, uh, and uh, please enjoy the, uh, the next two days. I think it's a wonderful opportunity to come together and share ideas, uh, talk to some experts in the field, and to think about what the next three, five years really has in store for uh, local journalism and local press. Thank you very much. Yeah, we can take, yeah, absolutely. We can take some questions. It was that clear? It was totally clear? All right, then. Well, thank you very much and enjoy the day. Thank you so much. Thank you. Appreciate it. Thank you. Muitíssimo obrigado, então, Scott. E houve uma pequena mudança no programa que está aí. O Maurício Mauro vai falar durante o almoço de hoje e não durante o almoço de amanhã. Mas o resto é como o Scott nos mostrou. Bom. Vamos então agora para a primeira mesa, que tem como título o papel do jornalismo local, como estruturar uma operação sustentável. E para essa mesa nós vamos ter a experiência, é, alguma experiência internacional, que vai ser relatada a nós pelos nossos convidados, que tiveram a gentileza e a boa vontade de atravessar os oceanos para chegarem aqui a São Paulo. E eu vou chamar inicialmente, a ideia é que com essas experiências a gente dê partida à discussão de como nós podemos aprender dessas experiências internacionais e nacionais, a parte nacional será tratada pelo Alberto Dines, para que a gente possa dar partida às nossas discussões sobre aqui o Brasil. Inicialmente, então, eu quero chamar a professora Emma Miz, que é uma jornalista especializada em mídias sociais, e que atualmente é professora na Universidade de Cardiff, no país de Gales, Reino Unido. A Emma trabalhou na BBC e, e começou no jornalismo impresso num jornal local, depois trabalhou na BBC e atuou na BBC também como produtora de mídia social e atualmente é instrutora da Escola de Jornalismo da BBC e dirige o Centro de Jornalismo Comunitário da Universidade de Cardiff. Emma. Hi there, thank you for having me today. Um, I'm going to try and speak really slowly because I know I have um, quite a strong accent, but I'm delighted to be here today to talk about local news and what is the role of local journalism. I'm going to speak from experience, from what we do in the UK and what we do on a daily basis and how we are striving for the same as you in Brazil to find a sustainable future for local journalism. The problem that we have in the UK and globally has been the decline of print. So nationally, local papers are closing. And in the UK, large media organisations own local newspapers. And when they become less profitable, they close them overnight, which then leaves a huge gap in communities with local people having no access to local news, which can be such bad news for local communities. 
who's making the local authorities accountable, who's reporting local news, views and events. It's really important that communities across the world have access to good quality local news. Wales, which is the country where I come from, um, it has 3.6 million residents, which is substantially less than here in Sao Paulo. Um, <laughs> Uh, and the Western Mail is the national newspaper of Wales, and currently the figure stand, circulation figures stand at 23,035 copies, which is a, a decrease of more than half. There were 55,273 copies being sold just uh, in 2000. So if this continues compared to the same period, if sales continue to fall in similar numbers over the next 10 years, there will not be anyone left reading the Western Mail, the national newspaper, by just 2021, which is a staggering um, statistic. So this means that less than 1% of the population is buying the national newspaper in our country. But it's not all bad news. There's been a really high increase in digital readership. So this is South Wales, is one um, which covers uh, the south of the country. has seen a 46% increase in digital readership. There's been a 14.6% increase for the Daily Post, which covers the north of the country. Then Wales Online is a 16.7%, and then the Argus is 36.1% increase. So these figures are for the first half of this year, for 2013, compared with the same period last year and all publications had also risen significantly in the last end, second end of 2012. So this is really good news. It's not that people are turning away from local news, they're just accessing it in a different way. So as Scott said previously, those with internet access and devices such as tablets, mobile phones or computers are now more likely to be very interested in local news and information. 73% of people who access local news have done so um, on their smartphones. And this has been over the last two years. So over the last two years, there's been a 73% increase in people accessing their local news via their smartphones. And 55% of people who now use hyperlocal media more said it was due to them getting a smartphone or tablet. And this has also been over the last two years. So it now means that in just two years, over half of the population are accessing local news a lot more than they ever did before, purely because they got their hands on a mobile device. So community news provides very functional information, which you don't get on a, a national level. And these are the kinds of things from a report that came out in April of this year by Nesta UK, looking at the demand for hyperlocal media. 50% of people wanted local weather, 41% of people wanted local breaking news, 32% wanted local entertainment, 30% wanted to access what's on, where to go, things to do, and 27% wanted community events. But news without local journalists equals a democratic deficit. Since newspapers have become so more centralised, this is a global problem. Stories which are really important to communities which can affect their future are not being reported as they are not regarded as important outside of this area. So on a national level, something that might affect an entire community goes unreported. This leaves entire communities without access to news on important local issues and without a platform to air their views and have their say which is really important for news on a local level. But the emergence of hyperlocal is not apparent only in Wales and the UK, but is reflected globally, which is why we are here debating the subject today. But what exactly is hyperlocal? The term hyperlocal, I'm sure, will be heard a lot today. Uh, it's been defined by Nesta as online news or content services pertaining to a town, village, single postcode or other small geographically defined community. It also includes online communities of interest. So if you have people with a niche interest in a particular subject, they can be online communities. But equally, as, as Nesta have called it online news, we also think of it as, as any news. It could be a print publication, it could be a leaflet. 
that goes out to your local community, just letting people know what's happening. So what is the value of Hyperlocal and what gets covered? So at Cardiff University, in conjunction with, um, with uh, Birmingham City University, there's been a big research project which is ongoing called Creative Citizens. It reveals that the community stories are covered most, followed by many stories um, on local councils and the services they provide and support. So these are the statistics on what they found on the topics that get covered mainly. So 13% of stories are community-based stories, 11.7% cover local politics, and 11.5 stories cover sport. This is not that different to traditional media. But there are some changes when we look at who gets to speak. So the people involved in local politics, local businesses, and members of the general public, these are the people whose voices are heard most on hyperlocal news sites. Comparing the figures with those of mainstream local news, there are some continuities, but also important differences. As in traditional large media organisations, politics and business are high on the agenda. However, unlike mainstream local news, you get members of the public and local civic society groups having their say too. And this is where the difference comes in on hyperlocal platforms. There's one successful hyperlocal in Wales called the Carfilly Observer. And I asked the editor and founder of the Carfilly Observer, what role do you play in the community? And he said, I try to cover the stories that other people aren't. So he's plugging a gap in the market. So there are other people covering news, there are other newspapers and publications covering his county borough, and he tries to cover the stories that other people aren't, which make it really important and really relevant for local people. So I work at the Centre for Community Journalism at Cardiff University, where we have a unique fusion of research, outreach, development and training. The centre was established just over a year ago to address the need in, in looking at the issues of sustainability and the future of local journalism. The then head of school, Justin Lewis, was fed up of going to conferences and everybody speaking so negatively about the future of local journalism and decided let's be proactive, let's do something positive about this. And from that, the Centre for Community Journalism was created. So what we do at the centre is we take the information we get from the research project and we, um, we try and translate that into practice and we go out into communities. As one of the leading journalism schools in the world, we felt it was important to move with the times and to keep understanding and learning from the emerging hyperlocal landscape. This is why the centre was launched just more than a year ago. We have been bold in our mission in that we want to help revive local journalism and have started at grassroots level by creating community news hubs in areas of need. We aim to launch 10 new hyperlocals in the next five years and are already on our second in just the last four months. We've also looked by speaking to hyperlocals and found out the need because of the, the issue of sustainability, many local journalists also need to have other jobs in order to have an income. And a big problem they had was getting information in at the end of a long working day was trying to find stories. So they said, wouldn't it be wonderful if there was a way of people in our community letting us know what was going on instead of just tweeting it or putting it on Facebook? Wouldn't it be wonderful if there was a device where they could send it straight to us? So part of what we've been working on over the last year is a new platform which is called Story Knee, which translates from Welsh to our story because we want people in communities to share their stories with their local news teams. It, we're currently in closed beta, but over the next few months we are hoping to open it. And it, it, the interesting thing is that it was created in a minority language. The first hyperlocal we launched with was in the Welsh language, therefore it was created in Welsh and then translated into English. So we know this works in all languages. So hopefully over the next, over the next year this will be a platform that will be available to all of you in this room for free, which you can use and try and get your community engaged in what you are reporting and they can start sharing their news with you as well. So how to structure a sustainable operation? 
I can only speak from experience from what we've been doing at the university and when we set up our hyperlocals. And what we do every time we set up a new local community news site, we uh, analyse what we did, what worked, what didn't work, and then we take what worked and we uh, we translate it and we move it forward to the next um, to the next hyperlocal. So research. The key before doing anything is do your research. Research your patch. So know your audience. You need to know their age range, their employment status, what's their connectivity to the internet like, what are their habits, what do they do, what do they like, what do they dislike. It's really important that you know this information. You need to do an audit. What else is out there? Where else can they access news and information? Do they already get the information they need? Or is there a gap that you could be filling and should be filling? So you need to choose your platform carefully. There's no point in starting with a Facebook page and being online if your entire community like to read print. Or there's no point doing a print publication if, if your community um, spend all day on Twitter, for example. So you need to go where your audience already spend their time. There's no point creating content on a blog if many, access, many don't access the internet. The other thing you need to be really important of is to be realistic. Be re realistic with your time and be realistic with your money. Because at the end of the day, all these platforms we use are free, but they are not free in terms of time. So time is money. And if you start creating something on every platform, then it's going to take a lot of time to maintain those. So you need to know your audience and talk to your audience on the relevant platform. Then you need to choose your tone of voice and your content very carefully. You need to start thinking of your brand as a person. If your person, if you're, what kind of person uh, would your brand be? How would they talk to people? Because you need to connect with your audience. Um, finally, you need to know what is your goal. Are you plugging an information gap, or are you plugging a fill in a commercial gap? Because we'll, we'll be moving on to talk a lot about sustainability today, which is the holy grail for everyone. How do we um, run a sustainable operation? However, I think it's really important to not dismiss some people and some um, news uh, providers just because they're not sustainable, because they might not have set out to be sustainable in the first place. So if you are just doing something good for your community, who's to say that you're not successful? Obviously, if your aim is to set out to make money, then that's how you're going to determine success. But you have to know your goal. Without a goal, you can't have any um, target. So without a target, you have no objectives. Without objectives, you cannot measure success. Therefore, how do you know if what you're doing is working or not? So what does success look like? I hope you're not expecting me to have the answer today, because if I had the answer, I'd be a billionaire, because it's what everybody's looking for. But what I can do is I can show you some examples, just really briefly, which, um, which we can, I, I can give you links to um, again. So these are five very different hyperlocal um, sites that we've got, and we've perceived them to be successful in terms of community engagement and sustainability. They cover both. So onthewhite.com is a financially sustainable community news service which has grown in size and is a trusted source of news and information for the island it reports from. Yet King's Cross Environment is making King's Cross in London a better place to live, work or study in. It's, it's, had, it's had phenomenal changes for the people environmentally where they live to make their lives a better place. However, they never set out to make money but yet they're very, very successful because they're achieving their goal in changing the community that they live in. The Carfilli Observer set up as a website four years ago and is now a financially sustainable printed newspaper as well as a website as is on, and is on various social media platforms. WV11 is a volunteer-run, award-winning website dedicated to covering community news and events in and around the Wednesfield area near Birmingham in England. And the Filton Voice is also a sustainable community newspaper which is published monthly after launching just 18 months ago and now has three other sister publications. So the things to point out about the Carfilli Observer and the Filton Voice is that they have gone into print, they were online, in order to achieve sustainability they felt the need to go back into print. 
which kind of goes against what we all believe is that we all need to be digital. And they were very successful digitally, but finding it difficult to make money. So they've gone back into print. However, their publications are both free. Because they do a print run, so they can fully observe it as a print run of 10,000 copies, which means for advertisers, they have a guaranteed number of people who are going to see their adverts. Whereas if they sold the newspaper, they wouldn't have that guarantee and couldn't make as much money um, with advertising. So those are really interesting models, I think, that we should look at. I'd like to just... Um, I I'm almost at a close. I'd like to end with um, Hyperlocal Works Best, where it adds value to local communities and is rooted in audience needs. This is the thing that we must remember whenever we're covering local news, is that it must add value to your local community and it must be rooted in your audience needs. We at the Centre for Community Journalism are trying to achieve a network where local news providers can speak to each other, learn from each other, so I would urge you all to go to our website, which is uh, www.communityjournalism.co.uk, and it's very easy to register your publication. And what we want to do is to get everybody involved in local news across the world talking to each other. Uh, over the coming months, we're going to have a forum space on there as well, where you can ask questions, you can learn from each other, and hopefully learn from each other's successes as well as each other's mistakes, because we don't all want to be making the same mistakes over again. So this is part of what we're hoping to achieve, is to get everybody across the world talking to each other and, and talking and learning so that we can move forward and find a sustainable future for local journalism. Thank you. Obrigado. Muito obrigado, Emma, pela sua interessantíssima apresentação. E daqui a pouquinho, Emma volta junto com os demais palestrantes dessa mesa para participar do debate, ao qual eu espero vocês também estejam presentes com perguntas. É, vou chamar agora o Hans Decker, que é o presidente da Fundação Comunidade de Nova Jersey, nos Estados Unidos, entre as atividades dessa fundação, uma das mais importantes é a de ajudar a manter meios de comunicação, como o Hans vai nos explicar agora. Hans Decker, por favor. I'm going to thank you guys very much. Uh, I'm going to need help with the. Uh, Oh, I got it. Never mind. <laughs> uh, thank you very much. Thank you. It's, uh, we've had, I've had a very warm welcome in Brazil. It's been very fun. It's my first trip here. Uh, and I'm going to repeat a little bit of what you heard already, but maybe that will underline the importance. So uh, as you heard Scott say at the beginning, um, at least in the United States, uh, there is a strong belief there has been since the Founding Fathers about the importance of democracy importance to democracy of having strong journalism. So one of our founding fathers, Thomas Jefferson, said if he had to choose between government and democ or newspapers and government, he would choose newspapers. It would make for a stronger country. Uh, and um, I think as we search for sustainability in this very changing environment, it's important to remember that we're sort of in the middle of the storm. I think everybody's trying to figure out where to steer the boat. Uh, but the storm is still raging around us, and I'm not sure that there are easy answers out there. Uh, what's happened, I think, in the United States, which has been a big shift, is that the philanthropic and foundation community and individual uh, charitable givers are being asked to help build a bridge to sustainability for journalism in the United States, which is a big shift. Philanthropy has you know, supported helping the poor, uh, the opera, uh, but has not traditionally been uh, too worried about supporting journalism. So it's been a big shift for us, and we're kind of in the middle of the storm as well. Uh, again, a, re a repeat, but these are just some of the job loss numbers we've seen since the recession, or the Great Recession as we call it in the United States, in 2008. Uh, it's very stark numbers in terms of the loss of jobs in newspapers across the country. 
Um, even the New York Times, right, which is our largest national paper, very strong advertising base, has had over 200 newsroom cuts since 2008. They continue to struggle uh, to figure out how to handle the digital side of what they do, whether to have a paywall or not. Uh, and and it's, it's daunting when the New York Times can't figure it out for what a, a lot of the local newspapers are going to be going through, are going through. Uh, the New Jersey paper, uh, sorry, this is a, a little jumbled, but the New Jersey paper is the star ledger. The New Jersey is a state of nine million people. It's a very large state. If it were its own media market, it would be the seventh largest media market in the United States. And the star ledger is owned by the New House paper group, a very strong paper group. They had Cleveland and, and New Orleans. They've always been very strong. They have cut significantly over the last five years. Uh, about 40% of their newsroom left. In 2009, they took buyouts. And I think the reason that the civic community has been drawn into this, or the philanthropic community has been drawn into the conversation, is you look at the beats that left during the buyout. So as the paper scaled back, they scaled back on what we would call the civic side of what they do. So they still do sports, they do weather, uh, they do kind of gossip, if you will. But the, the beats that are important to having a strong civic community, healthcare, education, the role of the pharmaceutical community in New Jersey, religion, technology, science, immigration, those beats left. And it scared, I think, the philanthropic community about the kind of information our community is going to have to be democratic. Uh, into this void, um, there's been a very deliberate effort to sort of help start nonprofit news outlets. Um, a lot of these nonprofits would like to be for profits, uh, but have started out as nonprofits. And here you see a slide that sort of details um, uh, the kind of uh, news that's being covered by these startup organizations. So you'll see a lot of them started since 2008. Many have focused on state political coverage. I don't know if that's analogous in Brazil, but state political coverage. And again, I think it's hard in the conversation about sustainability. Part of that is driven by a journalism sense that this needs to be covered and less about whether we can make money there. Uh, and the foundation community, although we want to build a bridge to sustainability, is also worried about this civic information. And we're especially worried about a lack of coverage of state um, news issues, uh, sort of political issues. Um, As you can see, the other things that have emerged are metro level coverage, some national coverage, as Emma talked about, hyper local coverage. Those have been the places um, where we've seen what we would call flowers starting to bloom. Uh, even AOL founded Patch in the United States to do very, very hyper local coverage. I live in a town of 6,000 people. We have our own Patch. Now, they have struggled, if you read, they are struggling financially. I think the ad revenue statistic I saw was that for every thousand click-throughs, click-throughs, not impressions, on a banner ad on Patch, they get $15, which I guess in the digital world is an, ex is an expensive rate, but from where I sit seems a very hard way to run a business. So here are some examples of some of the leading things that have emerged uh, that, are being, that are sort of regarded as being very successful. Two of them are national, the Center for Investigative Reporting and an organization called ProPublica. Um, they've been very successful kind of national reporting, very focused on investigative journalism. Um, we have founded NJ Spotlight. I'll talk, talk about that in a second. And the Texas Tribune. Um, and Texas Tribune is probably the, uh, how would we say it, the, uh, the bell of the ball, the star of state political coverage in the United States. They've been the most successful financially. Uh, so if you can see these banners, here's what we were trying to do with Spotlight. So when we saw the Star Ledger cut back, what we did is hire former journalists from the Star Ledger to create something called NJ Spotlight. And it very, had a very deliberate intention to focus on those undercovered issues that we were worried were going to slip through the cracks. So you'll see education, energy in the environment, health care. They do a lot on state, 
politics, not so much the horse race side of state politics, but the, the issues in the authorities, in the departments, uh, what's gonna happen, we're, as folks I'm sure have read, we're going through a big, what we call Obamacare. What's healthcare gonna look like in the United States in the state of New Jersey? Um, and we're trying to use all the traditional tools that Emma told you about and Scott told you about, social media, uh, and we, we do some stuff to make it more reader friendly where we have a number of the day, we do profiles on folks. Um, one of our challenges, I'll touch on some of our other challenges, one of our challenges is to take state news coverage and localize it. So New Jersey, I don't know again if this is analogous in Brazil, but New Jersey has lots of local towns. And so what happens at the state level impacts local towns, but people view it through a local town prism. And so we have a hard time getting readers to engage if it doesn't say Chatham or Summit, if it doesn't say the name of their local town, and it only says Trenton, which is the state capital. So one of the investments we're trying to make is how do we localize the information so that there's demand at the local level? Because New Jersey, like a lot of states in the United States, is a very local place. Uh, as Scott said at the beginning, um, this is NJ Spotlight's budget, um, small is good, right? So the Star Ledger's operating budget in 2008 was $70 million. Uh, Spotlight's uh, has grown from $368,000 to $868,000, very, very small. Um, it puts a lot of strain on the staff as we search for sustainability because we've really very focused our resources on journalism. So we have four, we have three journalists and one person trying to sort of work on the sustainability front. And that creates sort of uh, challenges on the sustainability work that I'll touch on in a second. Uh, here's a sense of the, of the breakdown of the budget. I'll go into these sources um, more in depth later, but you'll see the largest part of the pie is philanthropic support. So a lot of, uh, uh, no one, people would not call that sustainable. I don't know about in Brazil, but in, in the United States, foundations have the bad habit of doing something for three years and then moving on. And so the newspapers or the startups are very worried about what are we gonna do if the foundations leave us. Um, but again, I think we see ourselves as trying to provide this bridge and we wanna see that the portions of that, the pie slices change. Here's the Texas Tribune's budget. Um, again, you see a little bit bigger. Folks who know Texas, Texas wants to do everything bigger. So the Texas Tribune is bigger. About a $4.5 million budget in 2012. Um, and again, I'll touch on sort of the, the individual sources of income in a second. Um, one of my sarcastic lines has been uh, that if you hire journalists to run your startup journalism effort, you get lots of journalism. You don't necessarily get folks, however well-intentioned, who are focused on the business side. So they live in a world, our journalists, and we love them, where daily content is important. There are stories to be chased every day. And the work on the sustainability side gets pushed down to the bottom. So, we even had a rule now that on Fridays, we're gonna to try to focus on the sustainability. And those of us who sort of own the newspaper, if you will, are get frustrated that we're not more focused on the sustainability side. The other thing that I think our journalists, and they're lovely, but they come from a very old school world of journalism, is that they are constantly chasing the reader. So when they report to us about what they're doing to be successful, they report, we've got more readers. We had more people come to the site this month. And I think the hard part in this new environment is that the break between reader and revenue, especially in small places, has been broken. So it used to be, you could say, we've got X millions of readers at the Star Ledger, place an ad with us. At the small startups in the United States, there aren't enough readers for real advertisers to see a market there. And there's some ideas around sharing readers and sharing advertising revenue, but, but in large measure, the, I would argue the break, there's been a break in that system. So if you look here, it's hard to read, but we're very proud of NJ Spotlight, Spotlight because they have 52,000 readers a month. 
in the world of journalism, that's a small number of readers. And the, in the world of traditional advertisers, that's a small number of advertisers. So even if they doubled, right? Even if we worked really hard, we had more content, we strained ourselves to get more readers, it still wouldn't necessarily create advertising that would sustain the entity. So one of the questions, I'm scared to do this in Google's offices, but one of the questions we've asked ourselves as we sort of plan for the future is, and this is a line that one of our trustees, one of the board members of NJ Spotlight said, is who is Google's customer, right? And I think the traditional way to think of Google's customer is I am Google's customer, I'm the searcher. But again, hopefully Google's not here. Uh, Google thinks we're the product. The searcher is the product. The customer is the advertiser. And what we're trying to do at NJ Spotlight and with other startup efforts in the United States is who is really the customer? Whoops. So if you look at the types of support that uh, NJ Spotlight gets, on the philanthropic side, you basically have two categories. The first are foundations that are concerned about the role of journalism in democracy. So they're there for the kind of main principle behind NJ Spotlight. And there are, I think you'll be surprised, corporations, individuals who that message really appeals to. They understand the role that journalism can play in a community. In the United States, we, we call journalism the fourth estate, right? It was a huge institution in our country in sort of playing a role of keeping everybody accountable. Not always perfectly, but that was what, and by and large, the newspapers did. And there are folks that will pay just to continue that role. Second, there are foundations that have specific interests. They're interested in education. They're interested in healthcare. And they will pay to see that kind of coverage in the community. On what we would call the sponsor side, not the advertiser side, but the sponsor side, there are trade unions and corporations who will pay because they want certain, they want to, I don't want to say, they want to advertise to a very targeted audience. So the nice thing about NJ Spotlight's audience, as Emma said, is the, the NJ Spotlight audience, although small, are the sort of the influential policy interested folks around New Jersey. I call them sort of, in the United States, the phrase would be inside the beltway, which means inside Washington, D.C. So inside Trenton, they're the insiders that are very interested in state policy. So NJEA, which is the Teachers Union for New Jersey, a very, very powerful organization, a very financially successful organization, wants, certain, wants to make sure education issues are covered uh, and continue to be covered in this state. In the United States, it's what happens with charter school, what happens with teacher accountability. Those are all issues we're wrestling with. And they will pay to sponsor the site they don't have any demands on the journalism. I'll touch on a, later, a little bit later. It does seem like the firewall is risky. Um, and Verizon, which is our big phone, kind of online phone company and landline phone company, they have public mandates to get information to certain communities forced by the state, and they will pay to be in front of that audience. Here is a recent list published by the Knight Foundation. The Knight Foundation, I'll touch on in a second, has been the largest foundation in the country that's devoted to sort of sustaining journalism as we go forward. And they did this breakdown by surveying the sites in the United States by the type of revenue that people are getting. Corporate sponsorships, which I touched on. Advertising in a traditional way. Syndication. So one of the things that has worked very well for NJ Spotlight is to share their content. So NJ Spotlight's content now goes to the Philadelphia Inquirer. It goes back to the Star Ledger. It goes to the public radio uh, network in our community in a way that it never used to happen in the past because those folks used to compete. But because of the cuts, it's the Star Ledger and at the Philadelphia Inquirer, they have a real demand for content. And in fairly modest but important ways, they will pay for the coverage that NJ Spotlight provides. Subscriptions. I think is probably the smallest driver right now of new revenue. Uh, and then services, which I'll touch on in a second. On the contributed revenue, as I said, you see foundations and you see individual donors. To give you a sense of the scale, um, 
you can see what happened to foundation funding, uh, the role foundation funding is playing in four of the startups in the United States uh, from 2010 to 2012. Only at the St. Louis Beacon is it a small percentage of the budget. It's almost in a lot of our startups, it's usually 25% or more of the budget. So it's a critical piece. Events. Someone called this the other day the, the, uh, um, the holy grail of sustainability. And the, 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 the best at events uh, and creating revenue events is Texas Tribune. So I don't know if you've seen things, but there, the New York Times has things called Times Talks. The New Yorker has the New Yorker Festival, and the Texas Tribune has the Texas Festival. And what they do is they bring in uh, politicians, influential leaders, and they have a series of events that folks will sponsor. At, the, at NJ Spotlight, we will make 20, 20 to $25,000 on a two-hour event. And it's the same issues that have driven the coverage. We'll put a panel together on the role of education in our state, and the NGAA and other interest groups will sponsor the panel. In Texas, uh, they think they can almost be sustainable at 50% of their revenue on events in the near future. The other big dri revenue driver that I think is important to focus in the future are these foundations and other interest groups and individuals who will pay for a certain type of coverage. Emma was yelling at me last night at dinner about they can't pay for a certain type of story, but at least so far, I think we've been able to maintain the firewall. The Robert Wood Johnson is the largest healthcare foundation in the United States. They have $8 billion in assets. They want certain coverage about healthcare not to disappear. They're as equally worried about the decline of that coverage as anybody else. And they write us a check at NJ Spotlight for $150,000 a year to make sure we have a healthcare reporter. It's also, I think, important from the journalists inside, and again, I think this is where the firewall gets a little shaky, is for us to think about Robert Wood Johnson as our customer as much as we do the reader. So what are the sponsors are looking for in the type of coverage? Uh, again, not ordering up a story, but are we covering the public health type issues, because that's what Robert Wood Johnson cares about, that will enable them to continue their support. Our journalists, and maybe they're a, a bad example, have a tendency to not focus on what Robert Wood Johnson's interested in coverage, and more focus on what they see sort of is the critical news need. We're trying to strike a balance. I would tell you that in terms of soliciting individual donations, the biggest uh, success story is around investigative journalism. There's a huge demand in the United States for investigative journalism. There is a concern that it's a very expensive type of journalism for papers to do, that it will get cut as papers continue to cut. And so both at ProPublica and at uh, Center for Investigative Reporting, you will see huge amounts of individual donations, over $8 million a year in 2012 for investigative journalism. ProPublica, I think, has run four Pulitzers since they started. They've been very successful uh, in their coverage. Um, and so we think that's a huge growth uh, opportunity for us on revenue. And I will close by just thinking about traditionally in the United States, the, the public sector has subsidized traditional media. So in the United States, public notices had to be run in the local paper. People had to pay for public notices to be run. Um, and one of the questions we're asking ourselves is how can we transport those public subsidies to this new environment? Nobody's forcing anyone to run public notices or pay for public notices at NJ Spotlight or the Texas Tribune or ProPublica. Uh, there were tax breaks on the postage rates, as obviously in the digital community that doesn't matter very much. Uh, and there were tax breaks for papers to run their business. The question is, what can we do in this new environment to transport those subsidies so that the revenue picture, as we sail through this storm, becomes a mix of traditional earned income, maybe some philanthropic support, and some public sector support. And then in the near future, that's the mix that will allow folks to find their footing, would be my argument. Obrigado.
Muito obrigado, Hans. E agora eh, vou chamar o terceiro conferencista, Alberto Dines. Dines, todos nós conhecemos, foi diretor do Jornal do Brasil por 12 anos, quando o Jornal do Brasil era o melhor, mais influente, mais importante Jornal do Brasil. Depois ele foi diretor da sucursal da Folha, no Rio de Janeiro, foi diretor da Abril, em Portugal, durante muito tempo, e, ao voltar de Portugal, criou o Projor, criou o Observatório da Imprensa, e é o nosso grande professor e patrono. Alberto Dines. Obrigado, Carlos Eduardo, pelas, pelos adjetivos e pelo carinho. É, eu queria começar dizendo que, no meu tempo, meu tempo é diferente do tempo de vocês, é, dizia-se, o jornalista é um especialista em ideias gerais. É, e eu acho que eu sou exatamente isso, um generalista é, é, que sempre, sempre sonhou com, com o jornalismo comunitário, local, provincial, qualquer nome que seja, é, mas nunca conseguiu exercê-lo. Eu consegui identificar a minha primeira, meu primeiro sonho de fazer jornalismo local foi nos anos, no início dos anos 60. Imaginei que seria possível criarmos redes de jornais que acompanhassem o desenvolvimento rodoviário brasileiro, que ela era a época da indústria automobilística, e criando ao longo das rodovias é, redes de jornais que atendessem as pequenas comunidades. É, e foi um sonho. Nossa profissão é chamada de é, a última profissão romântica, é, é, e, e foi um sonho, um, uma nostalgia de alguma coisa que eu nunca tinha feito, mas gostaria de fazer. Mas também não é, não é apenas é, exclusiva da minha vida. Né? Eu lembro que o meu, um dos meus mestres em jornalismo, portanto, bem mais velho do que eu, que foi Samuel Weiner, é, ele dizia que ele precisa, pelo menos uma ou duas vezes por semana, ir para uma banca de jornais, escondido, e ver quem compra o jornal dele. Naquela época já tínhamos pesquisas, já tínhamos números, estatísticas, mas ele queria ver, ele queria sentir quem é a pessoa que compra a última hora, que era o jornal que ele criou, não é? É, e que ele não conseguiu manter, infelizmente, por razões políticas. É, ele queria ver como, quem era a pessoa, como se vestia, como se comportava de, com o jornal na mão. Que, no fundo, ele queria conhecer a sua comunidade, não é? Ele, no fundo, ele queria é, é, fazer um pequeno jornal, porque, é, com números de 150 ou 200 mil exemplares que o jornal dele chegou a vender, ele tinha perdido o contato com esse leitor, esse leitor é, é, que, que é a essência do jornalismo. Né? É, portanto, é, essa ideia de pequena imprensa tem algo de nostalgia, algo de romantismo, e eu acho que é algo que precisa ser cultivado. Quanto mais nós nos tornamos membros de uma sociedade urbanizada, vivendo em grandes megalópolis, mais necessidade nós temos da particularização, da convivência, da pequena comunidade. Eu queria começar... É, compartilhando com vocês um segredo profissional que eu tento é, é, adotar há algumas décadas. Eu tentei formulá-lo da seguinte forma. Na dúvida, a melhor solução será sempre aquela que resolve ao mesmo tempo mais de um problema. Problemas não existem é, isolados na natureza, eles são todos encadeados, e ao trabalhar com propostas mais amplas, holísticas, não apenas evitamos efeitos colaterais, mas como também criamos dinâmicas espontâneas e convergências. 
No mundo multidisciplinar em que vivemos, a solução distendida, ampliada, além de mais eficaz, tem a vantagem de maior durabilidade. As novas tecnologias, os novos equipamentos <coughs> são bem-vindos, é, mas não resolvem tudo. Os velhos valores também são bem-vindos, mas eles não podem ficar confinados às elites. É preciso criar novas tecnologias capazes de distribuir os velhos valores. O processo informativo deste início do século XXI é simultaneamente fragmentado e, ao mesmo tempo, concentrado. As novas mídias digitais favorecem a pulverização e a dispersão. Mas o sistema informativo como um todo é, é, tende à concentração das empresas em grandes grupos, num processo que vem se consolidando há pelo menos quatro séculos. Reverter repentinamente a concentração dos meios de comunicação através do uso da força, como está sendo tentado na Argentina, significa colocar em risco a própria estrutura democrática. Não se chega ao pluralismo com golpes de força. E o que nos reúne hoje, aqui, é essencialmente a busca do pluralismo, pela via mais natural possível, tentando equacionar binômios e, se possível, trinômios. Um país com as dimensões e as desigualdades do Brasil necessita de mais vozes, mais eco, maior participação e melhor entendimento. Em outras palavras, mais jornais e melhor imprensa. Por onde começar? Criando artificialmente novos e poderosos grupos jornalísticos? Com que recursos e para atender que mercados? Convocar os governos para criar uma nova imprensa, cuja tarefa primordial será a de vigiar livremente os governos, é impensável. Ao iniciar o nosso projeto na Unicamp, na Universidade de Campinas, no início ainda dos anos 90... Obrigado. No início ainda dos anos 90 sob o comando do então reitor Carlos Vogt, pretendíamos introduzir um novo item na agenda nacional, o debate sobre a imprensa. Acho que fomos bem-sucedidos. Não exigimos novas leis, reformas de estatutos, estabelecimento de códigos rígidos. Optamos por algo mais simples e mais orgânico, Sabemos que, ao observar um fenômeno, intervimos, intervimos nele. Então, ao observar a imprensa, estimulamos um movimento natural por mudanças, interno, endógeno. Nós começamos, o Projor começou como Media Watchers, mas o Media Watching não é um fim em si mesmo, é um meio de buscar excelência. E excelência não pode ser alcançada por decreto, por códigos, por leis. A excelência é uma solução para diversos problemas conjugados. Nosso projeto de estimular a ocupação dos grandes vazios informativos no interior do Brasil, de certa forma, reproduz o que foi feito nos Estados Unidos no início do século XIX. Quando, junto com o trem, com a ferrovia, vieram os serviços. E o serviço mais alimentar é a troca. Troca de mercadorias, troca de informações, troca de conhecimento. Mercúrio era, na antiguidade, o deus do comércio assim chamado pelos, pelos romanos, 
Mercúrio foi o nome dos primeiros jornais em muitos países, na Inglaterra, na França, em Portugal, no Chile. Um grande jornal chama-se El Mercúrio. Um jornal é um motor que faz circular riquezas, que estimula as trocas. E a circulação de riquezas faz circular o poder. O primeiro veículo jornalístico a circular sem censura no Brasil, chamava-se Correio Brasilense, mas para circular sem censura, ele tinha que ser impresso em Londres, escrito e impresso em Londres. Quando ainda éramos uma colônia portuguesa e Portugal vivia sob o controle da Inquisição. Porém, em apenas 14 anos, conquistamos nossa emancipação. A partir do momento que foi criado um jornal livre, pequeno, era um mensário, que chegava aqui com 90 dias de atraso, mas a partir da circulação de ideias, da troca de ideias, da presença de mercúrio na vida brasileira, criou-se uma dinâmica tal que, em apenas 14 anos, nós tivemos a independência brasileira. A pequena imprensa é uma grande solução. Está aí o Correio Brasiliense para demonstrá-lo. Comunidade e comunicação são substantivos com a mesma raiz, comunes, do latim. Rigorosamente são afins. A comunidade se forma através da comunicação. A comunicação só floresce onde há uma comunidade, uma igualdade, uma identidade. Para iniciar o nosso projeto em abril passado, eu fui a Omaha entrevistar a extraordinária figura de Warren Buffett, o mega investidor que acredita na força da pequena imprensa e continua comprando pequenos e médios jornais. No fim da entrevista, contei-lhe que um dia lançaremos uma campanha nacional aqui no Brasil com o seguinte slogan, faça como Warren Buffett, compre um jornal. Ele deu uma gostosa gargalhada e disse algo assim, comprem jornais, criem jornais, mas não misturem imprensa com poder político. Criem democracia. E esse é o nosso desafio. Muito obrigado. Muito obrigado aos três conferencistas e vamos agora para a parte de debates. Felizmente, os três foram bastante concisos, então nós vamos ter mais tempo para o debate do que o previsto, que é sempre ótimo. É, quem se habilita a começar? Bom dia, obrigado. Eu sou a Anatônia, super feliz de estar aqui hoje, parte de, desse processo. É, obrigado pelos três apresentadores, principalmente Alberto. Eu tinha uma pergunta para os nossos dois amigos de fora. Eu, e o Alberto, acho que ele lidou com isso no final. É a relação da pequena imprensa com a política, tanto nos Estados Unidos quanto, no caso, no País de Gales. No Brasil, nós temos essa relação, muitos dos pequenos jornais ainda são têm uma ligação muito forte com os políticos locais. E eu queria ver se vocês poderiam falar um pouco disso. E um, a noção do que é pequeno. Falamos muito agora sobre pequena imprensa. 
E se a gente pudesse falar um pouco, o que é o pequeno comparado ao País de Gales com, com o Brasil? É, logicamente, a noção de pequeno muda. O que determinaria o pequeno? Obrigado. Um, small changes depending on um, uh, depending on the area that they cover. I mean, for you here, Wales is small because the national paper would be small. But we are talking really small communities. The hyperlocal that we are in the process of setting up at the moment is um, is uh, just a half a county, so it's probably about 30,000 people. Because what we found from our research is that people are not interested in what's happening in the town or the village next door to them. They just want to know what's happening on their doorstep. So anything that's happening on their doorstep is uh, of more interest to them to what's happening in the town or the county next door. So we, um, we define small as much smaller than I think you would in Brazil. Uh, and what we're coming back to what you asked about the politics as well is that uh, we do find with some really small ones they do tend to be more politically biased because with the national press we always have to, uh, have to offer a right to reply so if we're saying that um, a large company or organization for example maybe a supermarket might be coming into an area uh, we would always, as the BBC or as a national newspaper, offer a right of response to that organisation. Uh, however, in small, very small communities, we don't find that they do that as much. So I think that reflects more what happens in Brazil. Is that right? Yeah. Um, but yet small, um, I think small for us is smaller than it is for you. But um, hyperlocal can be as, as little as one street. It's something that's happening on that street, in the village, in the town, or even one postcode. That's, that's what we tend to um, class as hyperlocal. Uh, you know, I think small, uh, I'll just speak to NJ Spotlight. They have three full-time reporters uh, and then a network of freelance folks. Uh, one of the side effects of the downsizing of journalism is there are lots of available journalists. Um, and so, uh, you know, we, I think, what I think about in terms of small is where are you gonna invest the money? And in our world, and I say this with a smile, the journalists want to invest in more journalism. And I would argue that you have to have this balance between sustainability and journalism, but more journalism doesn't necessarily create sustainability. To your point about the politics, I mean, we obviously have papers in the United States that have a certain, are perceived to have a certain bend. Um, I think the bigger issue that we've been wrestling with is even with the best of intentions, as newspapers have shifted, um, there is a concern that we're losing the institutional memory that a lot of the traditional journalism provided. So the Star-Ledger, which is our paper, has a Trenton reporter, a, a state house, a, a state capital reporter, but she's 24, and she hasn't been through the battles before, and so she's, the, our, our older folks would say she's easily snowed. I mean, she doesn't know to ask. Well, we just, in 2002, we had the same issue. So I think we're less worried, I mean, I, I think we are worried about bias, because small seems intimate, and the desperation for sustainability, I think, poses risks. But we're also just worried about this kind of institutional heft that experience used to provide and losing that, and how do we sustain that? You know, one of the journalists in our orbit said, you know, journalism was a career. You could buy a house and build a family and send kids to college, and for in a lot of places, that's fading. And how do we restore that? I think is one of the things we think about. Bem, é, respondendo a Ana, é, eu acho que é uma questão extremamente relativa o que, que é pequeno. Em Omaha, a cidade natal do Warren Buffett, onde ele mora e onde ele comprou um jornal de mais de 100 anos. É, é, ele considera um jornal provincial paper, community paper, mas vende 190 mil exemplares por dia. Isso, aqui no Brasil, é o sonho da grande imprensa. É, então, a questão tem que ser, 
tem que ser pensada em termos, de, de novo, insisto, eu não posso pensar diferente, em termos de valores, não é? de atitudes. O Anso falou agora em intimidade. Não é? Eu mencionei antes o, Dese, o Samuel Weiner, um grande jornalista brasileiro, que ele queria conhecer o seu leitor. Ele não, não interessavam apenas as estatísticas, ele queria ter intimidade com o seu leitor. É claro que isso é uma coisa extremamente vaga. Agora, o Brasil é, é, é um país que tem 500 títulos de jornais diários, e é muito pouco para essa extensão. Temos quase 6 mil municípios, nós estamos, temos um déficit de vozes locais, né? o coro nacional precisa de mais vozes, vozes locais que se comuniquem, é, é, que sejam ouvidas e que possam fazer essa mediação que eu me referi, é, o assunto local transformar-se nacional e o assunto nacional chegar localizado naquela comunidade. Essa é uma, eu chamo de uma revolução cultural que nós temos que fazer. E, e é, esse é o grande desafio desse nosso projeto, é fazer com que a grande imprensa precise da pequena imprensa, e a pequena imprensa saiba pegar os motivos e os temas da grande imprensa e localizá-los ali. O país é grande, mas ele é vazio, ele é vazio, embora muito habitado, 200 milhões de habitantes, mas é, é, falta as conexões. Não é? E quem pode fazer essa capilaridade, palavra que foi usada aqui pelo Scott antes, é a, a pequena imprensa. Daí, daí a aposta, e daí o grande mérito do, do, do trabalho de Warren Buffett, ele não compra jornais é, para ganhar dinheiro, ele prefere investir na Coca-Cola, é, como investe, ou comprar Heinz, é, 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 ele, ele quer que a, o, a, a imprensa comunitária americana não morra e, ao, ao preservá-la, ele quer preservar os valores essenciais da democracia americana, que já tinham chamado a atenção de Tocqueville. Quando Tocqueville foi escrever o seu clássico sobre a América, o que ele achou extraordinário foi o senso comunitário. Esse senso comunitário só existe quando há um jornal ligado à comunidade. É, bom dia, meu nome é André Cabral. A pergunta que eu tenho, foi falado muito de jornalismo investigativo aqui, ainda vai ser mais falado. Aqui no Brasil nós vivemos uma intensa discussão sobre a relação da mídia com o poder judiciário e até com os governos. Estão sendo discutido um novo marco civil da mídia proposto pelo governo. E chega a ser seja ser exercido, muitas vezes, uma censura togada, até porque a pequena mídia não tem uma estrutura jurídica. Poucos jornais podem. E o, como a noção do direito no Brasil, principalmente em relação ao dano moral, é uma noção subjetiva ainda, em termos jurídicos, eu gostaria de perguntar qual é a relação judiciária, a experiência dos conferencistas internacionais e seus devidos países, e aqui no Brasil o que é proposto pelos palestrantes, pelo DIMES, que a gente possa fazer para poder vencer esse bloqueio institucional, geralmente provocado pelas grandes, pela grande concentração de poder na mão das empresas e também no poder político, que geralmente pode pagar os melhores escritórios de advocacia, que acabam ganhando muitas causas sobre nós. Eu vou fazer uma pequena adição para especificamente perguntar para a Emma como a Royal Charter pode afetar a pequena imprensa no Reino Unido. Sorry, can you just repeat that? How can how the royal charter that was just signed by the Queen about the new organism that will control the press? How does this affect the small or may affect the small press in the United Kingdom? Um, the, um, there's always been um, a really, sorry, there's always been a really healthy um, amount of investigative journalism in the UK, 
and um, and this uh, looks continued to um, this looks set to continue. Um, I'm an investigative journalist. I spent ten years of my life going undercover, doing investigative journalism, and it's something that seemed to be really important. And I can't see that changing <laughs> in the UK. I think it's really important. Um, that this continues. However, it does happen a lot less on a local level because you don't have the resources and you don't have the backup. And as was mentioned in the question, you don't have the legal backup. Um, however, um, I think it still happens on a national level, which is why it's really important that local press continues because how else are the nationals who have got the backing and the ability to do these big investigative stories, how are they ever going to know about the small ones that need to be investigated? So that's where the connection, like you mentioned uh, just now, it's really important that without local journalism, then the bigger nationals are not going to even know what's happening on local level. So it's really important this continues, and this is why it's important you do have um, democratic reporting on a local level, because otherwise the bigger stories, the important stories, are never going to get heard. It's important. And in the UK, this is what happens, is that the, um, the small... There's a, hundreds of small organisations that report on local issues and then that can be passed on to the nationals who can do the investigating on their behalf because they do not, as you quite rightly said, have the resources, the legal backup and a lot of um, local, uh, hyperlocals in the UK are ex-journalists, however there are a number who are not journalists at all, which is where we at the Centre for Community Journalism help offer training and resources and support. However, um, it's really important that before you embark on anything like that, you do have the skills and the knowledge to do so. I, I heard in your question sort of uh, what we would call liability protection. Um, and uh, I think there are lots of opportunities for small efforts to bind together on issues like that. So where it's very expensive for us to have the appropriate liability protection, if we could share that in the United States insurance so that we would be covered among a cooperative of hyperlocals, it might be more sustainable. Likewise, I think on ad sales. So individually, I don't have a lot of readers, but a shared network uh, of lots of hyperlocals where I could place an ad uh, and get to all of those readers, I think is an opportunity for sharing. And so, you know, journalism was a business, is a business in the United States. Everyone's used to competing to make money. Uh, and I think that's shifting now to figure out how they can cooperate on some of these sort of fundamental protection issues. Because I think you're exactly right. The, um, uh, the first story that NJ Spotlight did uh, when they launched was an expose of our utility company uh, and it was the first headline in the first day, and I received a call <laughs> from the president of the utility the second day saying, what the heck are you doing <laughs> sponsoring this paper? Now, you know, we have the wherewithal to stand up to that a little bit, but you could see for a fledgling startup that would have been a very daunting um, uh, moment. And I think it goes to this intimacy question. When you're reliant on those sectors to be sponsors, uh, it, it naturally has sort of a mental effect on your coverage and it requires sort of an editorial uh, strength that I think is hard in some of the small places and maybe again that's something that could be shared. Esse problema da censura togada é extremamente importante e talvez é inconcebível, incompreensível para os nossos visitantes, porque é, nos países demo, efetivamente democráticos, a justiça está aí para garantir os direitos. E o direito, um dos direitos fundamentais é, é de, de, se exprim, de pensar e de se exprimir. E no Brasil dá-se o inverso. O grande órgão de censura tem sido, isso numericamente comprovado, tem sido a justiça. Inclusive, censura prévia. Temos casos sucessivos que, felizmente, agora começam a ser noticiados, da, do juiz, em vez de ser o garantidor 
da justiça, não, é o, é, ele é o avalista da injustiça. Agora, isso no plano nacional, no plano é, 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 local, comunitário, isso é, eu imagino que seja muito pior, onde o, o juiz local e o político local se conhecem, tem uma intimidade também, uma troca de favores, e isso deve, imagino que seja infernal. Mas isso só pode ser resolvido com uma conexão entre a pequena imprensa e os órgãos maiores, cooperativas, é, as entidades regionais, com o PROJOR, com o Observatório da Imprensa. Para isso, o Media Watching está aí para justamente é, é, botar a boca no trombone, como nós dizemos em português, é, 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 e, e denunciar essa aberração em que a justiça, hoje, no Brasil, virou um órgão de injustiças. Próximo. Minha pergunta é para o Alberto Dines. Meu nome é Laírce, eu sou de um jornal de uma cidade de interior bem pequeno, e o Dines, na sua fala, ele falou que entrevistou uma pessoa, que no momento não me lembro o nome, Warren Buffett. que disse, crie jornais, não misture com política, crie democracia. É, eu gostaria de saber o meio desse veículo, da pequena imprensa, se sustentar se você trabalha com uma, é, com uma linha editorial investigativa, principalmente na parte política, que é o nosso caso. É, automaticamente você não tem nenhum apoio do poder público porque você não misturou-se com política. Automaticamente, no interior, cidade muito pequena, como a minha, que tem 70 mil habitantes, quem acaba mandando na cidade é um grupo de empresários que tem um poder de poder é, fazer com que esses veículos tenham essa sustentação. Automaticamente, por você ir contra a política, você não tem também esse mercado que são desses donos de empresa, que são desses empresários. Como é que ficam os pequenos veículos, então, para se sustentar diante dessa situação, que é o que a gente vive hoje em Jabuticabal? É, eu queria só remeter você para a segunda, o segundo painel hoje, hoje pela manhã, como ser independente sem correr risco de vida. Né? É o painel que vai ser integrado pelo BUT, o Francisco Beuda, a Cecília Peruso e o Wilson Marini. É, é, não, essa é uma questão, não é uma questão só sua, esta é a realidade da imprensa local, comunitária brasileira, eu sei disso, eu não tenho na algibeira uma solução. Se você quiser, eu vou à sua cidade e vamos, e vamos botar a boca no, no trombone. É, é, e o Observatório da Imprensa está aí para nós denunciarmos isso e criarmos um, uma, é, é, digamos, uma consciência de que o pequeno, o pequeno jornal é a essência da grande imprensa. Não é? e agora, não tenho a solução para você, nesse momento, mas me disponho a ajudá-la. A, a resposta à sua pergunta é o objetivo desse seminário e desse projeto. E nós vamos buscar juntos as respostas à sua questão, que nós temos plena consciência de que, como disse o Dines, é a questão fundamental. Como é que você consegue ser independente e sobreviver? Né? Próxima intervenção. Bom dia, eu sou o Otávio. A minha pergunta é relacionada à educação. Um dos principais desafios do da imprensa como um todo, é o gap educacional, onde nós temos, aí sabemos, 50% da população não consegue ler um texto ou entender um texto de forma efetiva. Então, e que é quase que um pré-requisito para que as pessoas consigam ler é, a imprensa, entender e fortalecer a democracia. Então, eu gostaria de saber, na opinião de vocês, como e isso, esse gap ele é bem maior nas pequenas cidades, onde está a grande e pequena imprensa. Então, eu queria ouvir um pouco de vocês é, como que a grande e pequena imprensa poderia, a contribu poderia contribuir para diminuir o gap educacional nos projetos e contribuir para a sustentabilidade dela também com isso. A 
I think it's easier to do in a digital age because looking at what we, um, the, the statistics is that more people are accessing local news via devices and um, because of mobile devices they're accessing news on the go and therefore there's been a huge increase in the number of people who are interested in images, photographs and videos. So um, what I would start if there was uh, if there was a way of, of people in my community that couldn't read what I was providing them, then I would start doing interviews. You could do audio clips, you could do video clips, and get the information out there. It's really important that people without information, they can't be educated. So if they can't read that information, then find another way of getting that information to them. And I would, uh, what we do a lot in the UK is now because of the way people access news, um, and uh, over the last two years in the UK, 55% more people access uh, local news purely because they've got smartphones and mobile devices. So take advantage of that and take advantage. What works on these devices is images work really well. You just need to look at the way that Facebook has changed its algorithms in that people like to share images, they like to share content and text on images. So it's really important that you try and find a way of getting the message to those people. If they can't read, find other ways of doing it. YouTube videos are exceptionally popular. I'm sure we'll hear over the next two days about how videos can go viral. So it's really important that you, you know, get, it's not, I always say it's not about um, spending money on devices. You, you just need to have um, a small camera or a small phone in your pocket and you can get this news and information out to people. You can film it on the go and you can upload it wherever you go. And that's what's important with local news and information is that you can create it where you are, share it where you are and that people where you are know what's happening. Um, you know, I, you could argue that the course of the US presidential election was changed because a waiter at a, a, a fundraising event had a phone uh, with a camera and filmed uh, Mitt Romney talking disparagingly about, I think it was the other 52%, I can't remember what the number was. And so it's fun in the United States and in, in, when a New Jersey story happens, you have the sort of traditional TV and they arrive with four trucks, eight cameras, 20 staff people to support the cameras, and then there are four startups with their iPhones filming it, and it seems quicker, nimbler, cheaper. Uh, and so I do think there are opportunities that being small uh, provides to be, it's the barriers to entry are so much lower than they used to be. Desculpe. É, é na esfera da educação, da saúde e do transporte é que o jornalismo comunitário tem vantagens fantásticas sobre o, jorna o jornalismo da, da, das grandes urbes, das grandes metrópoles. A Folha de São Paulo não pode ir lá na sua cidade, você não deu o nome, mas imagino que seja aqui em São Paulo, e tratar do problema da escola, o... o das condições, das instalações, da deficiência é, do corpo docente. Agora, você pode fazer isso. É, você, na pequena imprensa, é que faz a diferença. Então, essas esferas que são diretamente é, é, ligadas às necessidades da população, é, é, evidentemente, é aí que vocês podem ganhar, ter grandes vantagens, são as vantagens competitivas suas, diante da grande imprensa. Próximo. É, meu nome é Cristina Zahar, é, eu sou jornalista há 25 anos, trabalhei é, na Editora Abril, o meu último trabalho, e agora eu estou numa iniciativa, que é um Venture Lab de mídia, aqui no Brasil, para fomentar o empreendedorismo. É, vocês falaram muito em conhecer o, le o seu leitor, a sua audiência. É, o que vocês acham da técnica do design thinking, que é uma técnica de brainstorming, que parte da necessidade de um super user para criar produtos e serviços é, sob medida? Sorry, I missed the last bit of that. Sorry. Design thinking. I haven't come across design thinking. So 
Yeah. So it's um, so you, you, what you mean is getting everybody thinking together. Sim, é, a nossa proposta é juntar times é, que tenham designers, jornalistas, né, como storytellers, é, coders and business people é, para gerar projetos de mídia. E essa técnica ela parte da necessidade de um super user, que é o, o hyperlocal que você estava mencionando. Então, eu gostaria de, de saber de vocês como conhecer melhor a sua audiência. O design thinking é apenas uma técnica, que eu estou citando porque é uma técnica que nós temos aplicado. Mas eu gostaria de saber a sua opinião e também outras maneiras de conhecer melhor o seu, a sua audiência. Uh, what we do in the UK is we go online and we look at... Um, we look at everything from, we look at census, so I'm not sure the equivalent of the census, so how many people live there, the age, the demographic, their salaries, their connectivity, and we assess and evaluate all of that's the first thing we do. Then we move on to look at what else is out there, what's already feeding the need, so where are the gaps? So what we need to look at, what are their interests, what are the gaps, what are they already getting, what are they missing? So it sounds uh, in Brazil as if what they're missing is impartiality. So one thing we would look at is how do you give that to them? I don't have the answer to that uh, right now, but um, it's really important with the research. And I think that the fact that you've got a team together is really important because when we, um, majority of hyperlocals in the UK tend to be one person uh, or a couple of people. And what we do with the ones that we set up is we get members of the community together to create a team. And what we found is that um, every single hyperlocal needs a driving force. It needs one person that takes ownership of it. Um, and otherwise, with everybody trying to have an opinion, so it comes back to the old school journalism of having more of an editor, but not necessarily just an editor in the traditional sense of being a journalistic editor, but also an editor of the business as well. So somebody that's willing to drive it. So do you go into towns and and put teams together? Is that what you do? It sounds very similar to what we do at the Centre for Community Journalism. So what we are trying to do is to create a network where we look at successful ones and see what's working, but we also understand that in different towns and communities the needs are going to be very different. So we've just set one up in Cardiff, which is the capital city of Wales. Um, there are 36,000 Welsh speakers in Cardiff and there was no online provision for them to get their news information, what's on through the, through the medium of the Welsh language. So we set that up, but what the information and news that's available in the capital city is completely different to the one that we're setting up in Triorki in the Ronda, which is a, a, a working class mining community. The mines closed down, which left um, lots of, uh, you know, lots of jobs. So the, the issues are completely different. So what you must do is everywhere you go is you must look at that exact community and look at the community needs, look at their wants, look at what they've already got, and then start filling the gaps. I um. You know, we're, although we're very worried about what the reader wants, and I would argue that we don't, we're not thoughtful enough about of, uh, guiding our coverage to that. We also have this civic mission of what we would say in the United States is forcing people to eat their spinach, getting the child to eat something they don't want to eat. Uh, and so we have this, this ring of people who we think ought to be worried about these issues, ought to be engaged in these issues. And so we try to think about what can we do to how to, to reach them. You know, and Google, Google is the number one refer of readers into our site. I, I would argue it's probably the number one refer of readers into all of the sites. And understanding how to use the Google technology to drive people who don't know they're looking for your site, which I'm sure I think we're touching on later in the seminar, it's remarkable. I mean, we have, we have a governor. Uh, in New Jersey who's going to run for president. He's a very popular figure. So just having his name in a story doubles the traffic because people Google Christie and then boom, they come to our site. So I think, you know, it's understanding 
the readers you have, but also thinking about, from our perspective, the civic purpose and the readers you don't have and how to drive them into the site. É, meu nome é Aurélio Alonso, é, sou do Jornal da Cidade de Bauru. E a pergunta que eu vou fazer, vou dirigir ao Dines, é a respeito do monopólio que existe no Brasil, da propriedade cruzada, dos grandes meios de comunicação, que dificulta a, a pequena imprensa no interior. Eu sou da cidade de Bauru e lá tem uma afiliada da Rede Globo, que hoje já tem site, o Rio Grande do Sul vive isso, então, essa é essa a dificuldade, porque nós temos hoje na Constituição, aí, já está em 25 anos, para fazer uma série de, de, de regulamentar essa questão, mas hoje o que existe é um monopólio. A Globo é dona da televisão, é dona do jornal, da revista, e até da, do, do site, e até, às vezes, da mídia regional. Então, fica, é, é uma, uma competição muito difícil. Eu acho que isso não acontece nos Estados Unidos, porque os Estados Unidos tem uma legislação, é, o país de Gales também, Inglaterra, tem uma legislação nesse sentido de não ter concentração. Na Inglaterra tem canais estatais, tem a BBC, e não tem tanto canal comercial. Né? É, o modelo de comunicação no Brasil é um modelo é, é muito predador, economicamente, financeiramente. Então, eu queria saber se a gente não fazer essa reformulação na Constituição, se a gente não discutir isso, a gente não vai é, transformar uma imprensa comunitária mais forte. É, você tem toda a razão, é, e eu me referi, é, a um passar a questão da concentração, a imprensa, no, a mídia no Brasil é extremamente concentrada, é, concentrada geograficamente, concentrada economicamente, concentrada é, politicamente, não é? e, portanto, ela não, é nem, não chega a ser plural. O presidente do Supremo Tribunal Federal, a nossa Suprema Corte, Joaquim Barbosa, recentemente, há três meses atrás, é, na Costa Rica, fez um discurso dizendo que falta pluralismo à nossa mídia no Brasil. Ele disse isso, o presidente presidente da Suprema Corte. É, essa é uma questão séria. Nós, no observatório, no site, temos discutido muito isso, temos exigido é, alterações e estamos tentando criar essa consciência. Eu só acho que a solução não é a solução argentina, de forçar com violência a desconcentração, porque é, nunca dá certo, nunca dá certo. É, e, e, e as soluções que a Argentina está apresentando, de passar para os sindicatos ou para a igreja, alguns canais de rádio e televisão, é um, é um retrocesso. Agora, nós temos que é, enfrentar isso. A criação de uma consciência comunitária é, é, é importante. É, a partir do momento em que, no, na sua cidade, em Bauru, é, mesmo sem o apoio da Rede Globo, você conseguir criar a consciência de que o seu jornal é independente e o jornal ligado, de alguma forma, à Rede Globo não é, eu acho que vai fazer a diferença também. Então, é uma luta. O jornalismo é uma profissão, eu disse que é uma profissão romântica, mas é uma profissão de luta, de combate. É, e nós estamos aqui para ajudá-lo. Eu, particularmente, com o resto de forças que eu tiver. Infelizmente, nós vamos ter que parar agora. É uma pena. O debate pode continuar nas conversas aí no corredor também. Vocês, claro, têm toda a liberdade para conversar com os nossos conferencistas. Mas nós temos que parar, porque, como eu disse no começo, nós temos uma programação bastante intensa e temos que ser rígidos no horário. Inclusive porque essa sessão e todas as outras estão sendo transmitidas pela internet, é, pelo Google+, Plus, é, e nós temos que fazer agora um intervalo de um hangout para o outro. Aqueles que estão em casa acompanhando, é, daqui a pouquinho, daqui a cinco minutos, um novo hangout vai ser aberto para a próxima sessão. E eu queria... Nós temos cinco minutos de intervalo. Nós vamos parar agora, daqui a cinco minutos a gente volta. E eu queria pedir uma grande é, salva de palmas para os nossos três conferencistas. Muito obrigado. Obrigado.